Shalom from Israel. I'm Shira Sokoram reporting from Tel Aviv, and I want to welcome you to Israel Frontline, your guide to Israel and the Middle East. We want to give you information you will probably not hear in the mainstream media regarding life in Israel and the Israeli-Arab conflict. And we'll add a biblical perspective to our reality. Today, we will present the second in a series of four programs about the United Nations. Because of the great importance for believers to understand, we will focus on the UN Security Council and its record of continually taking a stand against Israel and isolating her on the international stage. On the program today, the difference between borders and ceasefire lines, the meaning of Zionism, the role of the UN Security Council. Finally, our panel guests will weigh in on the subject offering their Israeli perspective. In 1973, Israel faced one of the worst wars ever, when even some of Israel's military leaders thought that perhaps Israel would be overthrown and destroyed by invading Arab nations. Syria, Egypt, and Jordan, together with nine other Arab nations, came from the north, east, and south and launched a surprise attack against the Jewish nation. In Israel, that conflict is called the Yom Kippur War. The Jewish people were once again in perilous danger of being destroyed. But in the end, the Arabs lost that war. Miraculously, as the small Jewish nation pushed back the invading armies from all three fronts. Arab nations then became more determined than ever to use the United Nations to grant them what they couldn't win on the battlefield. Over and again, the Arab Muslim bloc, along with their allies, creating a supermajority voting bloc, sought to delegitimize demonize and isolate Israel in the UN. The General Assembly passed numerous resolutions in the UN to force Israel back to the 1949 ceasefire lines, the lines which were created when in 1948 the newborn state of Israel was invaded by all of the surrounding Arab nations. Even though today the Palestinians demand that Israel return to the 1967 borders. Actually, there are no 1967 borders. What the Palestinians are demanding is that Israel return to the 1949 ceasefire lines because the Arab nations never agreed to any border with Israel. The official ceasefire lines were drawn exactly where the armies of the Jews and the Arabs stood when the ceasefire went into effect. Today, Israel knows that returning to the 1949 lines is indefensible against her warring neighbors, bent on destroying her. Israel therefore refuses to consider compromising the so-called peace negotiations unless the Palestinian people and the Arab nations surrounding Israel recognize that the Jewish people have a right to exist and have a right to live in their ancient homeland, which incidentally was promised to them by the God of Israel in the Bible. The Jewish people call the modern return to the land of Israel, Zionism. That name was chosen because in the Bible, Zion represents Jerusalem, Israel, and even the presence of God among the Jewish people. Modern Zionism holds that Jews, like every other people, are entitled to a homeland. And history has certainly demonstrated the need to ensure Jewish security through a national homeland after 2,000 years of unspeakable suffering among the nations. According to Zionism, 
Jewishness represents an ancient people with a shared origin of their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It speaks of a shared religion, culture, and history recorded in the Bible. One of the most serious diplomatic attacks against Israel happened in 1975 when the Muslim UN bloc and its friends succeeded in passing a resolution stating that Zionism is racism, meaning a Jewish state is by definition a racist state. Yes, I repeat, the UN resolution declared that the nation the Jewish people birthed in 1948 was by nature racist. The audacity is mind-boggling. 21 Arab Islamic states, Muslim dictatorships with virtually no religious freedom outside of Islam, engineered this resolution. The racist resolution against Israel passed with 72 yes votes, 35 no votes, and 32 abstentions. Later in 1991, when the Western nations were trying to put together one of their many peace conferences, Israel stood her ground and declared she would not attend any peace conference anywhere unless the UN racism resolution was revoked. The miracle happened and with strong US lobbying, the resolution was actually rescinded. Except for the resolution to endorse the creation of the State of Israel in 1947, this is the only other positive General Assembly resolution that has ever been passed in Israel's favor. However, the legacy of the 1975 racist vilification against Israel remains fully intact. UN committees, annual UN resolutions, Permanent anti-Israel UN exhibits in New York and Geneva headquarters are all dedicated to a relentless and poisonous propaganda war against the Jewish state. The United Nations majority bloc has made the UN into ground zero for today's new anti-Semitism which is the irrational scapegoating of Israel, blaming her for all the ills of the Middle East and sometimes even the world. The true intended target is the destruction of the Jewish people. If this accusation against the UN is hard to believe, take a look at this. In 2013, the General Assembly passed 21 resolutions against Israel. It passed four, only four, against the whole rest of the world. And this anti-Semitism has been full-blown since the formation of the United Nations. In its first 40 years, the UN passed 690 resolutions or resolution sections. 429 were against Israel. But this is only the beginning. Hostile UN resolutions against Israel are publicized by an unlimited budget through the media, articles, papers, conferences, experts, and committees throughout the world every single day of the year. Israel's former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Danny Ayalon, points out that each UN resolution is not just a bureaucratic process that ends up in a drawer somewhere, but part of an enormous propaganda machine created to convince naive citizens around the world that the UN is a moral organization based on truth and justice and exercising careful judgment. And since the UN member states oversee a variety of worldwide institutions, each one of them is also used with hammer force to crush Israel. First, there are all kinds of Palestinian units, including committees on the exercise of inalienable rights 
of the Palestinian people. Committees on human rights of the Palestinians. Committees on Palestinians living in occupied territories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of the main institutions of the United Nations have Israel as their bullseye. The Arabs' intention is to push through many more resolutions against Israel and then aggressively call on the world to boycott and sanction Israel for not obeying the UN resolutions, leading to her economic and psychological collapse. The most powerful arm of the United Nations is not the General Assembly, but the UN Security Council. The General Assembly, with its 193 members, though powerful, does not have the authority to pass laws actually considered binding on UN members. It can only make recommendations. Psychologically, its influence is very great yet there are limitations. On the other hand, a UN Security Council resolution has the force of international law, as under the UN Charter, all member states agree to carry out its decisions. The Security Council is the only forum in the UN where the US has any real clout. The US influence is represented and its ability to veto any resolution presented to this forum. Actually, there are five permanent members that can veto any decision. The US, Britain, France, Russia, and China. The US strives to keep these five nations in some kind of unity, preferring not to see any of the five use its veto unless absolutely necessary. However, the U.S. has saved Israel in critical times with its veto. Also on the Security Council are another 10 non-permanent members who serve two-year turns. A total of nine votes, if there is no veto, passes a binding resolution. According to the Foreign Policy Journal, this august council has issued 79 binding resolutions condemning Israel. And yes, Israel is the only state out of the 193 countries that is forbidden to sit on this council. From a human perspective, Israel seems doomed on the international stage as all odds are against her. But one day, all this will change because the God of the heavens and the earth has given this planet to his son, the Messiah. Yet, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. You are my son. Today, I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Stay with us as we now turn to a discussion with our Israeli panel of guests. Maos Israel Ministries is a Messianic Jewish nonprofit organization based in Tel Aviv. We exist to be a witness of the good news to the people of Israel through outreach, discipleship, and raising up godly leaders. We translate and publish outstanding faith books in Hebrew and powerful testimony books to reach non-believers. We have a Hebrew outreach website with original media content produced by our team. We support the Hebrew-speaking congregation Tiferet Yeshua in Tel Aviv. We sponsor and host seminars and conferences. We support our Arab Christian brothers who love Israel and the God of Israel. Our I Stand With Israel Fund serves as a benevolence outreach, meeting the practical needs of Israeli believers. Our dream is to see God's promises fulfilled until the day when all Israel will be saved. We will now turn to our panel 
asking them to share their Israeli perspective on the United Nations, Zionism, and the future of Israel. Today in the studio with us are Director of Operations for TBN Israel, Mati Shoshani from Jerusalem, Shani Ferguson, co-founder of Yeshua Israel Ministries, also from Jerusalem, and both of these were born and raised in Israel, and Israel Pachter, pastor of Beit Hallel Messianic Congregation from Ashdod. Happy to have you back again, and we have some interesting questions. The State of Israel was rebirthed following a United Nations resolution launching her modern creation. Mati, how could the UN pass a resolution declaring that the State of Israel is by nature racist since the United Nation was the body that approved the creation of the Jewish state? Let's start out with some facts. One, Israel is not a racist state. Just let's make that very, very clear. If that's all you hear, Israel is not racist or not a racist state. Uh, Two, to answer your question, the UN General Assembly that voted for the State of Israel in 1948 was, it consists most, mostly of non-democratic states. Most of the people voting in the UN General Assembly are not democracies and they're far from it. So their vote against the State of Israel represents more their sentiment that is pro-Muslim, anti-democratic, anti the US, Israel, and so right. on and so forth. So it's a political statement, but let's just answer the question of who is a racist state? South Africa, under the apartheid government, was a racist state. Mm -hmm. They had one set of laws, and this is what really a racist state means, an apartheid state means one set of laws, in that case, for the black uh, population, yeah. and another for the white. Another example that exists today, Saudi Arabia, a racist state. If you are of, or it's actually religious uh, uh, yeah. apartheid, if you are Muslim, you can enter certain areas in the country. If you are not, you cannot. Right. You have separate laws. In Israel, we have one set of laws so for everyone who's so an Israeli citizen. So give some examples in Israel of uh, equality among Arabs, Druze, Israelis. Here, here's the best example. I mean, it really is It's anecdotal, but also true. The judge who sent our previous president to prison for rape charges... Our Jewish president. Our Jewish president was nothing but Arab. The so, Arab an judge. An Arab judge judged our president Yes. And put him in prison. So what other example could you have exactly. of racial equality where the president himself is sent to prison by a, a member of a minority group? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, in one sense, it's a good example because you have your, you know, a representation of a high position that's offered to Arabs. In another sense, it's good to know that also it's not just like a token thing that they did, like just yeah. stick one smart Arab up there. We have in the military and in every body of government and school education just everything it's just they're they're the arab population and the jewish population blend throughout the entire country and and you go to grocery stores and you you go everything from the high to the low is um blended with all sorts of people from really any race yeah now do I think you of yeah education uh we always thought to love each other we always mm -hmm. thought of coexistence and mm -hmm. uh so it's just great to see there is uh, no racism. Exactly. I think that, uh, of course, you can always find in any country somebody who hates somebody else that's different than them. But this is a democratic country, and there are laws that give equality in jobs. Right. I, I think it's also good to, to note that, you know, because sometimes when you see the apartheid, you know, whatever, what they'll show is these young yeshiva students running through Jerusalem saying death to the Arabs. And I think it's important to note, because they don't show it, is that those yeshiva students don't like anybody that's like, they don't like Messianic Jews, they don't like Christians, they don't like anybody. Or that, secular or Jews. Or secular or Jews. Jews. They don't like anybody yeah. that's not like them. So to just say, look, you know, Jews yeah. are racist because right. they don't like Arabs, it's like, no, you have this minority of, of wackos right. that doesn't right. like anybody, and, and also, that's in every country. we're talking about a government policy. Yeah. Right. And that's what the U.S. Yes. is talking about. There yes. is no government policy that sets apart groups in, uh, in society. Absolutely. In Absolutely. society, there are differences, of yeah. course, on opinions, religion, and, and ethnicity. Okay, Israel. You know, the word Zionism, if the Arab people that hate Israel are looking for the worst possible word in the world, it's Zionist. They hate Zionist. Why have they picked that word, do you think, 
and made it the, the highest on the hill of all the bad things that they can say about Israel. It's very interesting because they could have uh, picked different names, but they picked Zion. Zion. Mm -hmm. And you know, Bible full of Zion, like full of Israel. When you read the Bible, you always read about Zion. God will bless you from Zion in the Psalms multiple times. So it's amazing, but it's very biblical word that describes uh, faithfulness of God to, the, to his plans, to his people, to the, even to the nations, because we also see the blessings from Zion to the nations. So actually, I think the explanation can be only, again, spiritual. Right. Because there is probably no others, because you know, God has so many plans uh, con connected yes. to Zion and nations, and of course, you our know, faith in Jesus. I have seen Arab uh, nations, leaders, that don't even want to say the word Israel. They don't want to say the word Israel. Right. But they will say that Zionist entity did such and such and such. They, they are not afraid to use that word. I think it's very interesting that this word, which actually represents, right, the kingdom of God when, mm -hmm. it come, when all is said and done, that's the word that they hate most of all. I think there's something fascinating. You know, we're, you can't really separate the spiritual element and the practical element. No, you can't. But I'll give you an example from both sides. You have spiritual people, so Muslims who, has, as a religious ideology, oppose Zionism, oppose the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, because they, their religion clashes with this religion, with, God, with God's promise in the Bible and the New yeah. Testament. At the same time, you have secular elements in society who are doing the same thing. Your existence as a state fulfilling biblical prophecy opposes their claim that God doesn't exist. So both on the secular and the religious level, Israel is a thorn in the flesh of so many different people around the world, yeah. and that's their obsession with this word. Yes. And I think it should have opened eyes of every believer, because when you read the Bible, you read about Zion, God's love for Zion, he will dwell in Zion, so many scriptures about that. So it yes. should woke up Christians and, and just say, hi, what's going on here? So it goes back to that same, uh, that same uh, statement that really the hatred of Israel is hatred against the God of Israel and the yes. Bible yes, for sure. that was written by by Israel. You know, I remember hearing this this woman who was uh, a liberal in America, and she was just, they were talking all sorts of politics that had nothing to do with it, but she was saying that she never understood, because she didn't know much about Israel either way, why being a liberal, like one of the things they do, you know, they're pro-abortion, they're pro-homosexuality, whatever, and they hate Israel. And she never understood that, because she was like, why is that one of the things that we, we like, do. we're so tolerant of everything, and then suddenly there's this, like, pointed entity that we dislike. So and it's, that, again, a spiritual Again, it's thing. a spiritual issue. Of course. Israel, Israel's existence contradicts the atheist thought and religious thought yes. of other religions. That's, that's the truth. Also, also, people, and I found this quite often, people who have a very limited amount of knowledge about the topic of Israel or Zionism will often pick up on things that are said by extremist groups, whether religious or completely secular, and they'll allow that to completely shape their worldview yes. on the topic. Right. Right. And they'll think, oh, Israel, you know, they'll just say these things. Israel this, Palestinians that. They have no idea what they're talking no, about. Nothing. They're just basing it on like a three-minute right. YouTube video right. and an article they heard, you know. It may yeah. be a good place yeah. to start with if you're kind of like, well, I don't know about Israel, whatever. Okay, if you're agreeing if you're holding the same opinion that Iran and ISIS and all these, you know, crazies that like hang people for yeah. driving if you're a woman or something, then you should consider, you know, a little more research. You know, the scripture says that all the nations of the world are going to come against Israel. Do you have any idea of how that can happen? What, what do you, can you paint a scenario? All the nations of the world come against yeah, Israel? You see, Israel uh, is a tiny little country. So literally, if all the armies of the world will come here, they have no place to stand <laughs> on our land. So for sure, it's not it's, it's not. Uh, so it's literally. representatives, you think, representative yeah, of them? Yeah, it's my idea. I think it is a representative of countries. And uh, today, if you see what's going on in the world, all the anti-Israeli agendas, you can easily uh, imagine that it's possible, or yeah. it can be possible in a few years or well, everything few decades. nowadays is proxy. It's you don't send yours. You get this entity that's close by, and you pay them, and you give them weapons, whatever. So it's even the the whole country, the whole world coming against Israel could just be everybody funds Hamas to come take us out, or ISIS, or you know, it, it could be something so small, or that everybody pulls back and no nobody 
supports Israel and nobody will talk to us and we'll just have well, God. Well, it's wonderful that the book of Zechariah does say that in the middle of this terrible war that's coming, and folks, it's not just going to be in Israel. The Bible talks about war everywhere, everywhere. In fact, Yeshua said, if he didn't come back, if the time wasn't shortened, there would be no flesh left alive. But, so, but the book of Zechariah tells us that in the middle of our troubles here in Israel, he is coming back and his feet will touch on the Mount of Olives. Mount Zionism. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, panel, and uh, that's it for today. Thank you for watching, and we hope we were able to give you insight which will help you pray in a more focused way for our nation and also for your nation. For more articles about Israel, sign up to the free Maoz Israel Report at maozisrael.org slash sign up. Make sure to join us next week for the third Israel Frontline episode in our series on the United Nations. We will talk about the UN Human Rights Council and why I call it a kangaroo court. On behalf of our team and myself, blessings and shalom from Tel Aviv. The Maoz Israel Report app brings the free monthly Maoz Israel Report publication right to your fingertips. All the reports in all available languages, videos and bonus photos, all in one place, on your tablet or smartphone. Download the free app today and get the insider's perspective of the way things really are in Israel. One of the ways Maoz reaches out to Israelis is by supporting the Hebrew-speaking, spirit-filled congregation Tiferet Yeshua in the heart of Tel Aviv. It is a place of intimate worship, corporate prayer, and powerful teaching for believers. But non-believers at the services always marvel at the love they receive from the people of God. Just as Yeshua said, through this love, they will know we are His disciples. Join us in reaching Tel Aviv and all of Israel.